It is good to be together this morning. Like you, I noticed last week, I noticed a lot of flags flying, American flags flying from people's homes and displayed uh, different places. I drove past uh, several different cemeteries and, and noticed American flags all throughout the cemeteries in front of different headstones. And uh, you know, we, we celebrated last week, we celebrated as a nation Memorial Day and, and remembering those who have given all for us as to give us freedom in this country. It was, it was good. Uh, this Starting this week, we will start to notice a change. We will start to notice a different flag that will be displayed. It will be displayed in stores and online, and it will be displayed uh, in commercials uh, throughout our communities. Uh, this week uh, begins in the month of June, what is called or our culture uh, calls and celebrates Pride Month. And it brings up, I think, for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, it brings up a question that we should wrestle with, that we should ask ourselves. As followers of Jesus, how are we supposed to respond to Pride Month? As followers of Jesus, as Christians, how are we supposed to relate to those in our communities, those that, are, that we go to school with, those that we work with, in our families, that celebrate Pride Month. And you're like, welcome to Grace Fellowship. We only tackle the easy questions. Uh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna get into it this morning because I think the next story in John chapter eight, I'm hoping will help us answer that question. I think it's a legitimate thing for us to think about as followers of Jesus, and I am, I'm hoping that John chapter eight is gonna help us. You know, you, you think about, as, as a follower of Jesus, let's say that you're on a sports team and the sports team that you're on celebrates Pride Night. What are you supposed to do? You know, should, are, you, are you supposed to wear whatever it is, the symbol uh, that they are pushing an agenda? Are you supposed to participate in that and just go along to get along? Should you, should you refuse? If, if you're the town that you live in, if they have a, a, a Pride Parade, should you participate in that, celebrate? Should you start your own protest march? What are you supposed to do in these situations? If your, if your neighbor displays a, a pride flag, let's say in their yard or from, uh, from a window or something like that, how, how are you to relate to your neighbor? Are we supposed to just ignore all of these things, just pray, Lord, please help us to get to July as quickly as possible? Or are we supposed to be confrontational on social media until our thumbs get blisters? I'm hoping that John chapter 8 is going to reveal to us uh, what God would have us to do and how the Lord would have us respond in a Christ-honoring way. Not only to the, the month that we find ourselves in and what's being celebrated in our culture, but more importantly to those that we would interact with, the people. Because what we're talking about this morning is uh, not so much the agenda itself, but uh, the hearts of, of people, the souls of people that we know and that we care about. So if you would, please open your Bibles to John chapter 8. We ended our study a couple weeks ago uh, in John chapter 7, the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. We took... We took three weeks to talk about this national Jewish camping festival that uh, Jesus was a part of and he taught in the temple and some of the things that he taught. And we just finished that up. And John chapter eight, verse two, tells us that at the end of this, this Jewish festival as they were celebrating uh, how God was faithful to their ancestors and brought them out of freedom from slavery in Egypt the next day, chapter 8, verse 2 says, the next day Jesus went back to the temple and sat down to teach, and a, and a crowd of people gathered to listen. Now, if you notice, if you look, there might be a line. Mine has a line before chapter 8 and then a line later on, depending on what version that you have with you this morning. There's like a bracket, and a lot of you might have like a disclaimer. I have a New Living translation in my hand, and the disclaimer that goes with this story says this, most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include this story. My NIV has a little different disclaimer that says the earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have this story. What they're referencing there are uh, the early church fathers, and you look back through their, their commentaries early on the first couple hundred years, there's no, 
There's no reference to this story. There's no comments about this story. Now, what all that means is that the Apostle John, who's, who's written this book, probably did not write down this story in his original book. But what's interesting is that it does show up. This story shows up in later manuscripts, not only in John's gospel, but it shows up a couple hundred years later in Luke's gospel in a couple different places. And so it raises the question, you know, what's what's going on? When you get into uh, 300 or so uh, A.D., uh, when the church was trying, they, they had different meetings. And what is authoritative scripture? What is inspired scripture? And they're, they're making decisions. This was included later on. And so there's debate. Well, why would that be on later? And why does it not appear in, in the earlier manuscripts? And, and so I just want you to understand that as, as Bible scholars look at this particular story, they agree that it is historically accurate, that this story, this, this moment in the life of Jesus actually did take place. And people in the early church knew about it. Now, it may not belong in this particular spot in John. It's possible that maybe this, this event didn't happen the day after the Feast of Tabernacles ended, it's possible that it happens some other time in the next six months. Because remember, this festival ended in the fall. We go six months into the, uh, the Passover feast. That's when Jesus was arrested. He was crucified. He was resurrected from the dead. And so sometime in that next six months, Bible scholars believe that that's when this event took place. It is recognized as historically true. And I think it is, it, it is worth, even though there's debate on does it belong here, does it belong somewhere else, I think it's worth pursuing uh, some time in, in the story this morning because it gives us some insight into who Jesus is. It is consistent with who Jesus is, what he taught, and what he was all about. And isn't that, isn't that what this series has been about? Who is Jesus? And I think that this particular story uh, gives us some insight into that question. So verse 2 tells us that uh, Jesus is at the temple. At some point, the festival is over. Jesus is back in the temple, and he's teaching. And there's a group of people who are gathering in the temple courts to listen to him teach. And then verse 3 tells us some other people show up. Verse 3, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law, the lawyers showed up. And the Pharisees showed up. They're the religious elites. They're the ones who monitor the rules and make sure everyone's obeying the rules. As he was speaking, the lawyers show up, the Pharisees show up, and they have an uninvited or an unintended guest with them. They brought with them a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, if you can imagine. And they put her in front of the crowd, Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. You might be wondering, how in the world did they catch this woman in the act of adultery? Were, were, were they on their way to the temple that morning, a couple of them on their way to the temple, and they're like, hey, if we see any open windows on the way to temple today, what do you say we take a little looky-loo in there and see what people are doing in the privacy of their own homes? <laughs> All right. Doesn't seem like a likely event, right? Doesn't seem like that's probably what happened. I think it probably is more likely this whole thing is a setup. In fact, when we get to verse six, we're gonna see that it is. It's more likely that, that maybe one of them or a friend of theirs, someone is having an affair and they're hatching a plan to catch them in the act. And this woman gets caught up in it. You're probably also wondering, where, where's the man? Where's the other half of this scandal? Why, why wasn't he brought in and, and, and put in front of everyone? Thrown into the crowd and humiliated. And I think these are great questions. Let, let's take our, what I'll call our skeptical curiosity. We should be curious about these things. Things just don't seem to be adding up here. Let's take our curiosity into the next part of the story. So they say, we, th we, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. 
What do you say, Jesus? And verse 6 gives us some insight into what's really going on. They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus, it says he stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. Now I want you to notice that that these lawyers, they, they cite the law. They cite the law of Moses. And they, they essentially bring a legal charge against her in the courtyard. They're, they're in the courtyard of the temple, and they're trying to turn it into a courtroom. They know the law. Why do they know the law? They know the law because they're lawyers. And I don't want you to forget that. I'm emphasizing it on purpose. These are lawyers who know the law. What's the law say? It's on the screen, Leviticus chapter 20. The law says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. That's what the law says. They're right. Deuteronomy 22, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. That's what the law says. The Mosaic law is very clear about the penalty for adultery. But go back to verse 6. What, what's going on here is, is not them trying to be the morality police. That's not what's really beneath this. What's driving this is a trap. They're trying to trick Jesus into looking foolish, into looking immoral. They're trying to discredit him by putting him between a rock and a hard place. Because if Jesus says, well, yes, she should be stoned to death. Well, now he's going to risk his reputation of being kind, his reputation of, of being compassionate and forgiving. He's also going to risk getting sideways with the Roman government. See, the Sanhedrin, these guys, they don't have the authority to put anyone to death without the permission of the Roman government. So if Jesus says, yes, she should be put to death, well, now they can run off to the Romans and say, this man, Jesus, is advocating the death penalty, and he's trying to sidestep you as the Roman authorities, and now he's in trouble with the Romans. And if he says, no, 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 she should not be stoned to death, well, now he's going to risk being seen as someone who does not respect the law of Moses. And if he doesn't respect the law of Moses, he must be a false prophet. So Jesus, they think they have him between a rock and a hard place. It's interesting, I'm imagining this in, in, in real time. It says that Jesus gets down and he's, he's writing in the dirt, writing in the dust. And they keep at him. He's ignoring them. They're asking him this question, and he's just ignoring them. And they they just won't let up. What do you say, Jesus? Can't you hear us? What do you say about this woman? The the law says, what do you say, Jesus? They, They won't let up. And so finally, he stands up, and he looks at them, and he says, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. The NIV puts it this way or translates it this way. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. It's a famous quote from Jesus. You you probably have heard people who don't even believe in God. People who don't believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. You probably have heard people requote this statement from Jesus. And oftentimes when they requote Jesus in some form, they're, they're, they're misquoting him or they're distorting what Jesus said in order to rationalize something that they've said, something that they've done, and essentially saying it like this. You can't criticize me. Don't you judge me for being wrong. You're not perfect either. Right? That's how they're, that's how they're trying to frame what Jesus said. But that's not what he said. Jesus did not say, nor did he imply, that only sinless people have the right to be judges. We would have no one on the judicial bench if that were the standard. Only Jesus is sinless. Okay, so then what did Jesus mean by what he said? Well, remember I told you the lawyers know the law. Well, there's someone else in the crowd that knows the law. It's Jesus, and he knows the law better than they do. And he's about to turn it on them. Jesus looks at them And he says, if any one of you is without sin, 
Let him be the first to throw a stone, uh, throw a stone at her. Look what happens. Look what happens. Uh, he gets back down and he starts writing in the, in, in the dust again. When the accusers, this is verse 9, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away. One by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was the only one left with the woman in the middle of this crowd. That's an interesting reaction. I didn't expect that. When, when you, if you've never read this story, that's not where you feel the story's going. Well, what was it that Jesus said that caused this unexpected reaction? The law is very clear about what should happen to an adulterer. All right, well, one possibility is, well, maybe they had a change of heart. Now, I've, I've heard people say that when Jesus was down in the dust, maybe he was writing something in the dirt, and, and whatever he wrote in the dirt caused them to have a change of heart. I, I, I don't know. Could, could they see what he was writing? I mean, you only have so much space around you. It's a crowd. I, I also just wonder, is that even possible? Think about what these guys were willing to do. In order to embarrass Jesus, they were willing to absolutely destroy and humiliate this woman. Did they really have a change of heart? I guess it's possible. It seems unlikely to me. Maybe it's more possible that when Jesus said, okay, uh, you throw the first stone and he throws the initiation back to them, you start the stoning, you start the execution. And they thought, well, we don't, we don't want to do that. We can't do that. The law, the Roman law says we don't have the right to do that. We better back off. More likely. Here's my best guess. I could be wrong, but this is my best guess. I think Jesus is about to set up a cross-examination that is absolutely going to destroy these men. And they know it. They feel it coming. Here's what I mean. Remember, they know the law. So does Jesus. The law, Deuteronomy 17, look at this. In order for this to take place, you have to have two or three eyewitnesses that see the same thing at the same time. That's the law. You can't just execute someone because one person said he did this or she did that. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man shall be put to death. No one shall be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. And the law also says the hands of the witnesses, so you've got to have two people in the crowd that day who saw it at the same time, and they're the ones who have to be the first to throw the stone. That's what the law says, and everybody else gets to, gets to participate. So he says, okay, the law says you're the ones that have to throw the first stone. So who are the eyewitnesses? Who are you? Where are you at? Here's something else the law says. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. But listen to this. If a malicious witness, a witness with malintent, a witness with an agenda takes the stand to accuse the man of a crime. In other words, they're coming because they want to hurt this person, not because uh, they want to see justice done. If, if, if that's happening, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord, before the priests, the judges who are in office at the time, and the judges must make a thorough investigation. Let's get to the bottom of it. And at the end of that investigation, it's shown that this witness proves to be a liar, a giving false testimony against his brothers, then whatever punishment that was supposed to be intended for the person on trial gets turned around on the one who lied. You see where this is going? Imagine this moment playing out in real time. Yeah, they know the law, and so does Jesus, and he calls them out on it. Imagine Jesus says, if any one of you is without sin, if you had nothing to do with this, if you're all innocent, okay, let's see the witnesses stand up and throw the first stone. Who are you? Where are you at? Imagine someone steps up, I'll throw the first stone, I'm one of the witnesses. 
Okay, we're about to have a cross-examination. You want to turn the court, uh, the, the courtyard into a courtroom? Let me ask you a question. How did you catch her in the act of adultery? How did that happen? Expli- were, you, were, were they in the park? Were they in the public park? Is that where you saw this? Were you just randomly looking through people's windows? How did, how did this happen? And where's the guy? What, why is he not here? Oh, maybe he is here. Maybe he's you. Maybe you and your two pervert friends concocted this entire plan in order to embarrass me, in order to get me sideways with the Roman government. You can feel that this statement is moving in that direction, and they don't want to be on the witness stand because it might get away from them. Their little plan might get exposed, and they walk away. Listen, I, I, I don't know if that's for sure what happened or for maybe one of the other explanations, but I know for sure every single one of those guys left. Not one was standing. Jesus knelt back down, gave him a minute to think about it. One by one, they walked away. There's no one left to condemn her. Remember what we read in the law? The law says you've got to have two witnesses. There's none left. Look what Jesus said says to her. He stands back up in verse 10. He stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did not even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Literally, that phrase is, go and leave your life of sin. And I I, I look at this moment, and I've got questions. Was Jesus soft on crime? Was Jesus easy on sin? No. What Jesus said here is not an excuse to sin. He did not ignore her sin. He did not normalize it. He, he, He did not celebrate her sin. He forgave it. He forgave her. And, and just so we all are on the same page, what that means, Jesus, Jesus paid for that sin when he died on the cross. This forgiveness cost him a lot. So here we have a woman living a life of sin, and Jesus did not call her behavior anything but sinful. And you see, he, he directly challenged her to change. But he also showed this woman love. He showed her kindness. He showed her respect. He protected her dignity. And he offered her grace. As we, as we consider, as followers of Jesus, how we are supposed to respond to things like Pride Month and all that it represents, but more importantly, how do we respond to people who celebrate it. I, I think we probably do feel that tension of wondering, I, I, don't, I don't know how to find the balance. Maybe we feel the tension of how, how do I find this balance between loving people who live sinful lives and at the same time hating sin? How, can that even be done? Can I even do both at the same time? I put several links to some articles on the digital notes. So if you, later today, you go to gracefellowship.online, you go to our digital notes. There's some links there to several articles and a podcast that get into this uh, a little bit deeper than what we have time for this morning. I just want to offer one simple solution to this problem, to this tension that we sometimes feel over not just this issue, but perhaps others. Jesus handled this moment with a full measure of both love and and truth. It's incredible. It's incredible to watch. And so as followers of Christ, we would be wise to follow his example in treating people with genuine love and at the same time remaining steadfast committed to the truth. Okay, what's the truth? Because that, that word seems to have gotten lost in our vocabulary in this culture, it's like, well, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, whatever you say, that's fine for you and I'll have something different. Well, that gets sideways real quick when your truth butts up against mine and vice versa. 
The Word of God tells us that the truth is God, and He's revealed His truth to us in His Word. And He's clearly revealed in His Word His standards for things like sexuality, His standard for for marriage, His definition of gender. These things are recorded in God's Word, clearly. But we have to remember that those aren't the only things that are in God's Word. They're not the only standards that, that God has Uh, has set for us, defined for us, not the only boundary lines that God has given us in his word. There's lots of them. There's instruction in here on how to live a life of integrity, how to live a life of honesty, how to handle our anger. There's instruction in God's word that clearly states the only one who is worthy of your worship and my worship is God alone. There's lots of things in the word of God that teach us how to live. But sometimes people will, will reject the truth by saying, well, uh, okay, that's, that's fine for you, but for me, that's, I have my own truth. This is just who I am. I was born this way. God made me this way. And if you don't accept me, then you must hate me. And that's not true. Sexual desire is not an immutable characteristic. It's not like your eye color, your skin color, how tall you are. We are talking about desires. We are talking about behaviors. Not only can those things change, they absolutely do change. I don't have the same desires that I had when I was young. Those things have changed. By the grace of God, my behavior has changed from the time I was younger until now. And he continues to change me. Think about, think about what that statement would say about God. If God, which he has, established clear boundary lines, clear standards for behavior, for desires, all of it, he's, he's clearly given those in his word, and then he would tempt us to violate the very standards by making you a different way that, that doesn't match up with his standards. He's going to tempt you with the, to, to go against the standards and, of behaviors and di- desires. That, he's, that would not make God loving. That would make God cruel. There's, a, there's another big difference between a biblical worldview, which is what I'm, what I'm sharing with you is a biblical worldview, our current culture rejects a biblical worldview and believes that, that right and wrong, can you pick your right, I pick my right, and whatever. The word of God says, no, no, no. God is the only one who is worthy to be able to say what is right and what is wrong. But we've walked away from that, not just in our culture, many cultures, because of sin. Sin has infected hearts and minds. And that sin, when it's left to fester, it, re, it results in, it manifests itself in, in rebellion, rebellion against God, rebellion against his standards. It's why we have broken relationships. It's why we have messed up sexual desires. It's why we have this confusion over things like gender. Because of sin, sin has broken everything. And that is the truth that followers of Jesus must unapologetically be committed to, But at the same time, how do we also live a full measure of love towards those who are living a sinful lifestyle or those who believe in sinful values? When I I think about those kinds of questions, I go back and look at Jesus in this story. Because in that moment in the courtyard, Jesus was faced with a dilemma, a tension. If he said, yes, this woman deserves to die, he risked being, being seen as someone who lacks love, who lacks compassion. And if he said, no, don't punish this woman, he risked being seen as someone who was abandoning the truth of God. And yet, and yet, Jesus brought a full measure of truth and love to this woman's sinful life choices. It's incredible. I, I, 
I don't enjoy being called names. Maybe that's your thing. It is not mine. Probably most of us don't enjoy being called a homophobe or a bigot or a hater because we have convictions about God's design for marriage and sexuality. Probably don't like those labels. And that's understandable. Can I just caution us, though? Let's not earn those labels in the way that we treat people. Maybe you go to school with a teenager who's struggling with gender dysphoria. Maybe you work with a guy who's living an openly gay lifestyle. Maybe you have a a family member who's struggling with, with lesbian lust. Could I remind us that the book of Genesis does not just establish God's design for marriage and sexuality. It does, but Genesis also establishes the intrinsic value of every human being. Created and loved by God. God's love longs to pursue hearts, longs to to reach out and see people healed and transformed. God desires for every person to repent of sin, be transformed by the power of the resurrection and his Holy Spirit. And it's it's not that God is waiting around for us to figure it out, to get it all right, to get our lives cleaned up and then step toward us in love. That's not what God does. God is pursuing people right now, wherever they are at. Romans 5, 8 says that this demonstrates God's love. While you and I, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to figure it out. He didn't wait for us to clean our lives up. He stepped towards us in love. And if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, we've, we, we've got to follow his example of bringing this full measure of love and truth. Which means we cannot hate people. We cannot disrespect people. We cannot allow ourselves to get baited into these back and forth social posts. Loving people does not mean that we condone sin. It does not mean that we celebrate sin. So yes, we can and we should politely, politely decline to have anything to do with with pride events or to display pride symbols. And and in those, those cases where we are asked about our values, when we are asked about our beliefs, yes, be prepared to speak truth in love. Have a, you ready for this? This is gonna blow some minds. Have a kind conversation. We've lost, we have lost an understanding of what a conversation is in our culture. But having a kind, loving conversation with people who are far from God, people who are living sinful lives, that is the best way to share truth. It's the best way to share the gospel. Face to face, back and forth conversation with listening and understanding and, 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 and just compassion. And I understand it seems at times like a really hard balance to strike. Yes, okay, hate the, hate the sin, love the sinner. How do I do that? Where do I find that balance? Especially if, if that person is coming at us and accusing us of being this immoral hater because you don't, you, you don't accept my self-proclaimed identity, my sinful life choices. And they come at us with anger and it's hard sometimes. I think that staying focused on the gospel is the key to finding this balance. Focusing on the gospel in our view of people and in our conversations, I think that's what's gonna help us keep this balance because the gospel declares that we are all guilty of sin. You are and I am. The law was given by God to make us aware of our sin. Guys, the verdict's in. You're guilty, I'm guilty. And it doesn't have to be sexual sin. Sexual sins are no more hellbound than dishonesty. Losing our temper. 
We are, we are all lawbreakers deserving of hell. That's the bad news of sin. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus paid the penalty that our sin deserves. When he died on the cross, he did so as a sacrificial payment. He died in your place. He died in my place. He died in your neighbor's place. Whoever you go to school with or where you work, your family members, he died for our sins. And so when we admit our guilt and by faith we accept forgiveness and grace, we receive the righteousness of Christ. Guys, the gospel is not offering us a get out of hell free card and then just go live however you want. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about heart and life transformation. It is about freeing us, yes, from, from hell, but it's about freeing our minds and our hearts from sin ruling over us. It's about our lives and our hearts and our minds being transformed. It's about exchanging our sinful desires for righteous desires. That's what God wants to do in your heart, in my life, and everyone else in this world. I think a lot of people think that law and grace are somehow in competition with each other. That they collide somehow, and it's just not true. They, they're not in competition with one another. They complement one another. We must be condemned by the law before we can be cleansed by God's grace. Nobody is saved by keeping the law. You know why? Because we can't. You can't, I can't, no one can. But nobody is saved by grace without first being indicted and convicted by the law. We wouldn't need a savior. We wouldn't need a redeemer to rescue us from sin and hell if we weren't already convicted and guilty. And so I think staying focused on the gospel helps us live a full measure of both love and truth. Because when we interact with people who live sinful lives, it reminds us of our own need for grace. I desperately need God's grace. Every day I need God's grace. And so do you. If I'm gonna treat people with kindness and love and dignity, I need to be reminded about what the gospel says about my own heart. But for the grace of God, I would be living a sinful lifestyle too. The gospel reminds us we all need Jesus. So how then should the follower of Jesus respond to things like, like Pride Month and those who celebrate it? Yes, with unwavering, unapologetic commitment to the truth of God's word, yes, but also a full measure of love and grace. We just need to know that the devil is gonna try to get under our skin this month. He just is. He's gonna try to irritate us. He's gonna try to goad us into saying things or, or, or treating people unkindly and, and damaging our testimony. He's gonna try, don't let him. Full measure of love, full measure of grace. But he's also going to try, with some of us, he's gonna try to deceive us into compromising truth. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. What if, what if we didn't look as Christians, as followers what if, of Jesus, what if we didn't look at June as something, oh, we just have to get through it and get to July, just, you know, hold our breath and hope we, hope we get to the end of it? What if we didn't look at it that way? What if instead we looked at this month as an opportunity to actually live out the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if we looked at this month as an opportunity to be able to not only say this message, but live this message of the gospel? You need Jesus, I need Jesus, we all need Jesus. Because you're messed up and so am I. And he's the only one who can help us. He's the only one that can transform us. He's the only one who can fix what's broken in us. What if, what if you and I had the opportunity to share that message with people this month in a kind, loving, grace-filled conversation? I pray that we do. 
Lord, thank you so much for your love and your kindness and your grace. Lord, so many times it, it, it can be easy if, if, if we find ourselves wanting to live a Jesus-centered life and, and we find ourselves, because of your transforming power, living a life that's different and living according to your word, that sometimes there can be this, this temptation to look around and see people who aren't with disdain or to look at them with condescension. Remind us not to do that. Remind us, Lord, that the same grace that saved my soul is the same grace that can save their soul. And I pray we would never forget that. But because of your grace, we would be headed to hell too. Thank you for the opportunities you'll give us this month and in the, in the months ahead. Lord, however long you give us breath to be able to share your good news of transforming resurrection power. In Jesus' name, amen.